please just pop yourselves on mute now. That would be awesome. And officially welcome to Whiskey and Almond. Welcome to edition one of the Sullivan's Cove Museum series with Fred Siggins. For those who haven't met me before, my name's Miranda and I'm your Whiskey and Almond events coordinator. It is a massive pleasure to be here tonight for such a special event that I'm very grateful for Fred for being able to bring to, to Whiskey and Almond to our little bar here. There's some absolutely incredible whiskies on pour that you know, we were talking about this just before the tasting kicked off that we never thought we would have the opportunity to taste ever. I think Jules was saying, you know, maybe some, some guy in, in, a, in 100 years will, will get access to the, to the museum series and he might be able to taste it, but, but that's us now. And I'm super, super excited to be a part of it. So thank you to Fred and thank you to the Sullivan's Cove crew for allowing us to do this. Um, if you haven't already, get yourself some water, set up your whiskies and direct any questions that you have to the chat box just down below. Uh, we will be answering questions during the tasting, but if it is a bit of a can of worms one, then we'll save that for the end because we've got about a half an hour portion just for a catch up, Q&A, community questions, all that jazz. So that's enough from me. I'm not going to hold it up any longer. I'm just going to send it straight on over to Fred Siggins, your Sullivan's Co. brand manager and pretty much unofficial all rounder at this point to kick off the tasting. Thank you, Miranda. Uh, thank you, Jules. Thank you, Whiskey and Almond. Thank all of you guys for joining us this evening. Um, as Miranda said, my name is Fred Siggins. I am the brand manager at Sullivan's Cove Distillery and uh, really, really excited to be showing you these whiskies this evening. I think um, the idea behind this was that we've obviously been pretty quiet at the distillery for the last, you know, eight months or so uh, since the borders shut down. We're you know, hundreds and hundreds of visitors a week come through and see us at the distillery to do tours and tastings. <clears throat> but we haven't had the opportunity to do that much this year. So we've been working on some stuff down there to make it a little bit more fun and engaging when we are able to open up again properly. And one of the things that we've been working on is building a museum in one of the little rooms in our cellar door. So we spent a lot of time digging around in the archives and the old boxes and really trying to catalog everything that we had and really trying to you know, dig into the information about it, looking at old distillation records, talking to the folks who were working at the distillery at the time those products were produced to really try to get a solid story about um, what those whiskies were and what they meant and where they came from and how they sort of fit into the uh, evolution of Sullivan's Cove Distillery. And then we, we built it and we looked at it and we thought, this is awesome, this is beautiful, and there's still nobody here to come and look at it. Um, so I thought, all right, I've got a couple of extra bottles of some of these crazy whiskies from the last 26 years of, of the history of Sullivan's Cove and, um, you know, had been really, really impressed with some of the online tastings that the Whiskey and Almond crew have been putting on over the course of the year and thought, what better way to share some of these incredible whiskies and incredible stories with everybody when we can't necessarily be together um, in person. And so, yeah, gave Miranda and Jules a call and said, hey, what do you think? And unsurprisingly, they were like, yeah, we should probably do that. <laughs> um, so, so here we are. And this is, uh, this is part one of two. We've got another um, sort of Sullivan's Cove Museum tasting that we're going to be hosting. With this one, <clears throat> what I'm really going to focus on is the story of Sullivan's Cove American Oak and the evolution of Sullivan's Cove American Oak. Because... The majority of the whiskey that we produce at Sullivan's Cove has always been aged in American oak casks. I know a lot of people sort of um, aware of our French oak, um, obviously a pretty famous whiskey for a few different reasons, but that's always only been a relatively small percentage of the casks that we fill because they're harder to come by. And um, so yeah, all the way back to 1994 when Sullivan's Cove was founded, American oak has really been the sort of um, the linchpin of the distillery, I suppose. So that's what we're going to go through. We're going to go through stuff that was distilled all the way from the um, mid to late 1990s, all the way through till stuff that was distilled about 10 years ago. And obviously things that have been bottled from the late 90s, all the way through to stuff that's been bottled this year in a range of different styles. And hopefully give you guys an understanding of how that style has developed over time and sort of where Sullivan's Cove is, is at now. Um, hopefully everyone's got their cocktail in front of them. The cocktail that you're drinking, I will maybe let Miranda tell you exactly what's in it. Yeah, no worries. So this was a creation by the bar manager here, Lachlan Watt, as per usual. Too many ingredients in this one to fit on the juice bag. This is Strega Curacao fermented watermelon driver muth monthanier with a base of Sullivan's Cove fire drum vodka. 
it just goes straight over ice in a short glass to your liking. And Fred, would you like to tell us a little bit about the Fire Drum Vodka? Sure. So, um, yeah, this cocktail is based on Fire Drum, which is essentially Sullivan's Cove New Make that has been pretty heavily filtered through charcoal and uh, diluted to 40%. So it's not exactly the same as Sullivan's Cove New Make. Sullivan's Cove New Make is actually like pretty full on, pretty rustic. Um, but we did do, you know, so we made some tighter cuts when we produced this vodka to make it not quite so full on. And um, yeah, as I said, filtered it quite heavily so that it did resemble something closer to a vodka, but it really is, um, you know, probably closer to a, uh, a like a single malt moonshine almost. Mm. It was a lot of texture, a lot of character, a lot of density. And um, at this point, it's not really something that we're producing anymore because we see the demand for our whiskeys being pretty crazy these days. So we're just kind of using the, the small kit that we have to try to produce as much whiskey as possible and not focusing so much on white spirits. But we did have a few cases of it at the distillery still and we knew that Lockie was a big fan. So we, uh, we sent it up to be made on this cocktail. And obviously like all of that texture you get from that hot distilled spirit is really kind of, shining through in this in this drink i reckon so pretty tasty absolutely and you can feel free to enjoy that right now before the tasting we're going to have a very short intermission of about five minutes and then we've also got that q a portion at the end it's not going to disrupt your palate so it's absolutely good to go whenever you'd like it yeah it is absolutely i'm definitely enjoying it right now and um so just before i get properly stuck in guys i wanted to introduce you to a few of the sullivan's cove crew who is sitting in on this tasting. We were all really excited about this tasting. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to, you know, I put the invite out there to, to the whole team to come in and, and join us. Um, so, and, and for Sullivan's Cove guys listening, please unmute yourselves for a minute to, to say hello. I'll introduce you guys first to uh, Sam Cumming, who is our sales manager, who is also, also here in Melbourne on lockdown. Hi, Sam. Hey guys. Pumped for this one. I've, uh, I've spent a lot of time since I started with Sully's looking enviously at our, uh, our archive and our museum list. So I'm pretty excited to finally be allowed to crack in and try a few. Absolutely. Me too. I will also introduce you guys to one of our um, most you know, fervent uh, whiskey fanatics at Sullivan's Cove, which is Ali Bana, who is our cellar door manager and sort of Tasmanian uh, brand ambassador. So she's down there in Tassie running the front of house distillery for us. Hi, Ali. Hi, how are you doing? Good, super, how you doing? I'm, I'm the same boat as Sam. Super excited to crack into to some of this older, older stock. It's really exciting. Absolutely. So this is yeah. stuff that even Ali doesn't usually have access to down at the cellar door, even though she actually has the museum. Um, I also love to introduce everybody to our managing director, Adam Sable, who's at home here in Melbourne as well. Hey, Adam. Hi, Fred. Hi, everyone. Enjoy. <laughs> Thanks for including me in this one. I know you normally keep me hidden away for these things, but uh, I'm honoured to be included. So enjoy, everyone. Thanks a lot. Uh, you, you know, I always like having you here, Adam. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Adam's, Adam's the big boss, he runs the whole show, so it's always nice to have him in on our tastings. And then, of course, uh, we've also got Richard, who's one of our distillers down at the distillery. G'day, Rich, how are you? Hi, really well, Fred, man. Nice to see ya. Um, and, and of course, um, last but certainly not least, our head distiller, Heather Tillett. Hey, Heather. How you going? Good, how are you? I'm good. I must confess that uh, the cocktail didn't last, you know, half an hour after we opened the box. So that's all gone. Yeah, my, mine's almost. <laughs> Just on the whiskey tonight. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> got more room for whiskey. Hey, um, have we got anyone else from the crew? I don't think I see anyone else. I think have that's I, it at the moment. I've, I've said hi to everyone. All right, that's good. Um, yeah. Oh, what, what a production. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. This is awesome. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, this will, this will probably be like the, the most of my own team that I've had in a, in a tasting, at least virtually. So it's really nice to have all those guys here. This is just Sullivan's Cove staff drinks and we're facilitating it, right? Yeah, that's it. That's how we, we, I mean, we do have staff drinks over Zoom these days. So thanks for joining in on our Friday knockoff. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I suppose without further ado, we will uh, kick on with telling you guys about some of these whiskeys um, and some of the history that goes behind them. 
Uh, Sullivan's Cove was first founded in 1994 and the original ownership group of Sullivan's Cove lasted from 1994 to 1999. And those original guys had what you might call an interesting approach to making whiskey. Um, like a lot of, you know, startup distilleries, and we certainly still see that trend continuing today, the whiskey that they were bottling was quite young. Um, really, they started bottling stuff as soon as it hit two years old, so legally allowed to be called whiskey within Australia. So the very first bottling of Sullivan's Cove ever was in uh, March of 1997, which actually makes it the very first Tasmanian whiskey to be bottled in the sort of modern era. Um, and uh, they had an interesting approach to it though, in that they weren't using small casks the way that a lot of startup Australian distillers will do to try to get something that has a fair amount of oak character in a short period of time. They were actually using 300 litre uncharred American oak casks. So they were toasted, but not charred. So basically big, big, big virgin, not very toasted American oak casks. And I'm not entirely sure why that's what they went for. These casks had never been filled with anything else before. They were not ex-bourbon casks. Uh, they were sort of commissioned specifically for Sullivan's Cove directly from the cooperage. And the only thing that I can think is that people, those guys were probably drinking a lot of California Chardonnay at the time, maybe a lot of the sort of big buttery styles of Chardonnay that were being produced in Margaret River in the, in the 80s and 90s. And they thought, yeah, let's go for fresh American oak. That'll do the trick. Um, so a lot of the original casks that were filled up um, at Sullivan's Cove were those big 300 litre uncharred virgin American oak casks. Um, the whiskey that we have in front of us is called Sullivan's Cove Millennium Gold. This was bottled in 1999 or 2000, and the idea was that it was gonna be a sort of commemorative release for the turn of the millennium, so 20 years ago. And um, they were gonna take it to Sydney and sell it to the tourists who were over for the Sydney 2000 Olympics. And they were like, yep, this is a great idea. People are gonna be absolutely into it. They're gonna smash through this stuff and we'll, and we'll make a pretty penny. Um, so that's why this particular whiskey is called Millennium Gold. And yeah, it is aged in one of those big 300 litre uncharred virgin American oak casks, probably about two or three years old, possibly four or five, but five at the absolute outset. So it would have been distilled sometime between 1994 and maybe 1997 and then bottled in 99 or 2000. Um, so very, very, very young compared to what we're releasing at Sullivan's Cove now and in a very different style of cask that we would generally employ at Sullivan's Cove these days. These days we're using predominantly 200 litre heavily charred American oak ex-bourbon casks or um, you know, French or European oak Australian fortified wine casks, which have, have also been charred before we end up filling them up with spirits. So really uh, quite different. I'm pretty excited to get my nose into this because I have never tasted this bottle before. This is a bottle that, um, yeah, like I said, it was, it was bottled over 20 years ago and we've just got a tiny handful of them still sitting down at the distillery. I'm not necessarily expecting great things from this whiskey, but um, it's certainly an amazing piece of the Sullivan's Cove story. And we'll actually hear a little bit later on how this specific whiskey relates to one of the other ones that we're gonna try um, from the sort of modern era of Sullivan's Cove as well. Already getting some really awesome tasting notes in the chat section there. We've got Whiskey in Isolation with Cappuccino and Wes Hatch with Shaved Almonds. There you go. Yeah, definitely, um, definitely a little bit of a little bit of sulfur. It really does have that kind of like almost cappuccino sort of flavoring, like a cappuccino flavored dessert type of situation happening to it, quite toasty. Um, probably less of that sort of like really astringent fresh American oak that I was expecting, but you do start to see a little bit of that kind of wave of bitterness uh, come through on the finish there. It's actually, to be perfectly honest, it's better than I was expecting it to be. <laughs> like, Way better, Fred. I, I'm, I'm actually really surprised as well. In, yeah. in the words of another uh, customer of ours, it's disappointingly good. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. I mean, I think that it, it's funny because the style of this whiskey is so different than anything that we would uh, 
produce these days or anything that we would bottle these days. But the DNA of Sullivan's Cove is still there. We're still using exactly the same equipment that we were using at the time. I'm sure Heather will be the first to tell you that the way she runs that equipment might be slightly different these days. But um, it, it is exactly the same kit. So we've only got one still at Sullivan's Cove. We do both uh, wash and spirit runs on that one still. It's a 2,500 litre pot still um, with a weird sort of hand beaten copper onion head on it and then a big kind of gooseneck um, and then a, a pretty straight line arm. So we're definitely creating some reflux at certain parts and then deliberately not creating reflux at other parts because we also have a, a worm tub condenser which as you guys know, um, ends up with like a bigger, meatier, sort of more rustic style of spirit with a little bit more sulfur content. So yeah, interesting things happening in that still. It's a unique shape and it's still the only one that we use today. So um, yeah, all of the whiskeys that we're making made on exactly the same kit. But yeah, like I said, we might, we might take a slightly different approach to, um, to making them. Uh, so, so that's that. Uh, interestingly enough, when Patrick Maguire, our former head distiller, took over or, or started working at the distillery in, um, he started in 1999, but he really took over properly as, as plant manager in 2004. And they were not as successful as they had hoped in selling all of this when they took their cases and cases of it up to Sydney for the 2000 Olympics and expected to come back with suitcases full of cash. It wasn't as successful as they were hoping. So they actually ended up with quite a lot of um, excess stock of this particular whiskey. And when Patrick finally took over, he cracked a couple of them open and tasted them and he just wasn't particularly happy with it. So a lot of these bottles, there are very, very few of them left in the world because a lot of them, Patrick actually ripped the tops off of them and poured them back out again and ended up using them to make whiskey liqueur and stuff like that. So there are very, very few bottles of this that actually ever sort of got sold to the public um, because most of them ended up back at the distillery and being used for other things. Uh, so obviously you can see that Patrick definitely had a little bit of a, a different approach to making whiskey than maybe those original guys who, who were there for the first few years. Um, what else have we got in terms of tasting notes coming through, Miranda? What do you guys reckon about this? We've got uh, some butter and people agreeing with Heather with the Werther's on the finish. Some yeah. sweetness, Junior's calling a short finish on this. But yeah, it's um, it's probably it's probably not as yeah, not as aggro as as I was expecting it to be. Heather, from from tasting this, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to taste this before, but do you have any insight about the way that it might have been produced, in terms of how the stills were being run and stuff like that, and maybe how that might be a bit different from how we do it these days? To be honest, the the distillation was at this stage probably quite uh, hot and fast. Mm -hmm. um, in comparison to the way we do it now. Uh, we do a much lower and slower distillation uh, these days. Um, but this particular whiskey was a, a vatting of a, a, a number of casks, um, quite a few in, in actual fact. So I don't actually know the, the exact amount of casks that have gone into it. I'll have to go look through the records, but I've certainly seen in a lot of our old records like this went to Millennium Cask, this went to Millennium Cask, so. Yep, all right. So it was actually a vatted expression then, which probably rounded yep. out some of the rougher edges. And it does taste yep. like there might be a couple of casks in there that are a bit on the older side. Like it doesn't all taste totally. too fiery, you know? But yeah, I think, I think it was probably, everything would have been like under six. Yeah, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were some sort of four or five year old casks that went into this yep. make. Totally. Very cool. Um, all right, uh, I suppose, uh, we should move on to whiskey number two. You guys ready to, to keep to keep going? Yep. Just give us a up. Yeah. Um, all right. So the second whiskey is really from, I suppose, the beginning of modern Sullivan's Cove. This comes from, uh, you know, the the labels basically look the same. Sort of the brand identity was the same, and that's something that Patrick Maguire created in 2004 when he really took over, not only as distillery manager, head distiller, but also as a director of the company, as one of the owners of the company. So you can see that it's got sort of quite a similar, um, you know, aesthetic and style to it as Modern Sullivan's Cove. That was really all sort of Patrick's work. Um, and at the time, 
he was um, still bottling stuff that had been produced sort of in the earlier times, basically the, the stuff that was produced between 1999 and 2004 when Bill Lark was actually working at Sullivan's Cove. So uh, when, when Patrick first took over in 2004, he was still bottling a lot of that stuff. And it was still quite young compared to what we're bottling now, but it was really, some of it was really very high quality whiskey. And um, that was really the time around about 2007 when this whiskey was bottled. It's really around the time that people started sort of paying attention to Sullivan's Cove and that we actually started getting some, some recognition internationally, some good reviews and write-ups and a couple of awards for sort of best whiskey in the rest of the world outside, you know, Scotland and Japan and that type of thing. Um, so this was really the, the series of whiskey that I suppose kind of kicked things off for Sullivan's Cove. So what we have is something that was, you know, distilled in 2000, so 20 years ago, in April of 2000. And um, the cask itself is a, is a 200 litre first fill American Oak X bourbon. And then it was decanted um, in June of 2007. So it's got a maturation just over seven years. And again, these days we tend to let our whiskies age for um, at least sort of two, three years longer than that. But at that point in the Sullivan's Cove history, pretty common to be bottling stuff that was around seven years old. The other thing about this one, which is not really something that we do very much anymore, is that the label says cask strength. Now, to be perfectly honest, this one is actually not 100% natural cask strength. It was actually standardized to 60%. So all of the cask strength bottlings that were happening at that point in time at Sullivan's Cove were standardized to 60%. But obviously 60% is still significantly higher than what we would do most of our single cask bottlings at now. 47.5% is pretty standard for us. So what we have here is... Um, you know, something that was distilled in that sort of middle period between 99 and 2004. That's about seven years old. That's 60% alcohol and is in one of those bourbon casks. This is the other whiskey that I have never actually tried. So I'm really excited to get my nose into this one as well and see how it goes. I to apologize. I held up the wrong bottle before by accident, but this is the correct one for sure. Hopefully it does the whole focus for me. Oh, well. I like that there's even a little bit of color that's come onto this, uh, this sticker here. You can tell it's aged. Absolutely. And for those who didn't get to see the Millennium Gold bottle, I really should have held that one up. It's the most expensive paperweight I'll ever use. I want to take it home. <laughs> <laughs> how, good is, how good is the bottle design and the label and everything? Though? Oh. I absolutely love it. It's like, it looks like something that my Nana would serve Sherry out of. I think it's brilliant. Absolutely. And that, that royal purple, I love that purple. Love it. So the, these labels were actually the labels that were used as the inspiration for our 25th anniversary bottling. Oh, wow. I wanted to kind of use that as a bit of a reference. So we had a lot of fun working with our designer and showing her that kind of hilarious old school bottle. She got really excited about it and was really, you know, really had, had good fun sort of bringing that into, into a little bit more of a modern design. And hey, you've matched it with your tie as well. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted, to wear the, uh, I wanted to wear the same outfit as on the tasting mat so that you guys would recognize me and not get confused. <laughs> I love that you did that. I love it. So <laughs> yeah, this one's definitely got like plenty of that sort of uh, kind of dusty, musty old um, American oak character coming through on the nose. It's like, it doesn't, doesn't really come across particularly hot for being 60% to me though. So Jules was just wondering, Fred, who else was using 200 litre American oak in Australia around the year 2000? Wouldn't be many, would it? Nope. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, uh, Lark was obviously producing whiskey at the time. They were generally using sort of 50s and 100s, I think is pretty standard over there. Um, and still to this day, as far as I know. Uh, Bakery Hill hadn't started yet because they're really the other Australian distillery that I think is known in particular for using full-size um, American oak casks that have been around for a while, but I think that they, um, they didn't open up until, what, 2007 or something like that. So, yeah, um, you know, the fact that we were using full-size casks right from, right from 99, well, right from 94 onwards, yeah, it's definitely one of the things that sort of uh, set Sullivan's apart. Heather, unmute yourself and give us your tasting notes, mate. What do you got? 
Oh, it's just a citrus bomb. Mm. It's like orange and poppy seed cake. I really love it. I, I dig the um, mandarin satsuma notes that are coming through. It's beautifully citrusy, very typical of the Sullivan spirit of that era. And it's nice to see that the that um, the cask hasn't overpowered that. They're still perfectly balanced and in harmony. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's definitely got some heat and some spice to it through the mid palate, but it's got that wonderful 60%. sort of- 60%. Yeah, exactly. But it's got, it really does have that sort of orange oil thing that you're talking about, doesn't it? It's like, yep. it's, it's like Jaffa lollies. I really like it. Yeah, it's lovely. Jaffa lollies. That was a, that's a great call. Terry's chocolate orange. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's super, super cool. And um, obviously at 60%, you're getting that really nice kind of syrupy uh, sort of character, even though we would have been filtering at this point in Sullivan's Cove history, we would have been filtering our single cask whiskies um, slightly more heavily than we do these days. Uh, we would have been using a, a process called flocking by where you leave the cask alone for quite a while and let the heavier compounds fall out of solution and then filter those out. Whereas we actually don't do that anymore for our single casks because we want them to be fatty and sticky and buttery and delicious. What do you guys think? Have we got some other interesting notes coming through? Yeah, we've got uh, a lot of sherbet, sherbet lemon. Agreeing with that. Tastes yeah. like Christmas from Susanna. Um, whiskey in isolation, I think, that's, I think that's Mark. He asked, what's the difference between a mandarin and a satsuma? There you go, Heather. <laughs> I'm literally Googling it right now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, tasting notes for the win. Um, Ali, what do you think of this one, mate? Have you had a chance to try this, um, these cast drinks from this era before? I haven't, no, it's really cool. I get kind of like a bit of a, a kind of struck match flinty note on the nose and I find it quite meaty as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really, really cool. Yeah, that, that meatiness is really typical of whiskies that were distilled in that 99 to, to 94 range and the stuff from beforehand. I think um, these days we probably try to aim for a slightly cleaner spirit as far as that more sort of struck match thing is concerned, but it's definitely a, a real hallmark of that kind of era of Sullivan's Cove, and it's certainly coming through on this one. Um, Alex here. Hey, Alex, he's just asked, has there been much of a change to how the wash is brewed over the years? I think, I think Heather would be the best person to answer that question. I know the answer is yes, but she can probably give you more detail. Uh, yes, in the sense that we've had a couple of uh, sources, all local collaborations with um, this long time local Hobart brewers, but in essence, the recipe has not. Uh, it's, it's been very stable throughout history and it's um, something that we keep under lock and key and very guarded uh, that's given a very particular type of spirit that is um, very much our DNA. And I think one of the, um, you know, primary things that we like to talk about Sullivan, at Sullivan's Cove as well, which is, you know, true of a lot of Tasmanian distillers is that we only use Tasmanian barley. And Tassie barley is, is brilliant stuff. It's got a lot of protein. It's got a lot of natural fat content, a little bit less starch than the sort of, um, you know, high octane distillers barley that you would see being used in Scotland. So, um, but it means that you get a little bit less alcohol yield, but it means that you do get more kind of texture and structure and flavor uh, from those big sort of meaty fibrous grains. And so um, definitely something that, again, is, is part of the sort of DNA of all Sullivan's Cove whiskies. And part of the thing that's really fun about um, our American oak styles in particular is that they do let that spirit sort of shine through. So in a tasting like this, it's really fun to taste spirits from different eras of Sullivan's Cove because the cask hasn't overpowered them. So you can actually see how the spirit develops over time and um, how the sort of quality of that barley really shines through. Definitely something that, um, that we sort of enjoy doing. We, you know, don't generally aim for styles of whiskey that kind of overpower the spirit. We really like the spirit to sort of come to the forefront and, uh, and, and let itself shine through. Um, speaking of which, the next whiskey that we have, this will be the first one that was actually released during my time at Sullivan's Cove um, and Heather's time and Adam's time. It was um, released in uh, 2017. Um, and the designation on this cask is TD0001, which means that it was the very first cask filled by Patrick when he took over as distillery manager in 2004. Um, at that point, again, 
you know, the, the ownership changed. So the designation at the start of the cast had changed. Patrick became part of the ownership group at that point in time, like I said, as well as being in charge of the whole plant and distillation and everything. Uh, so we started using TD at the start of the barrel numbers. And this is literally the very first one that he filled in 2004. Um, it is a 200 liter American oak, you know, sort of standard heavily charred ex bourbon cask. But the interesting thing with this um, is that, you know, in, in those early days in, in 2004, when Patrick was first in charge, if, if you take the sort of first hundred casks that he distilled, they can be a little bit hit or miss. You know, you can, you can tell that he was getting used to sort of running it on his own and making some changes and trying to figure out what style of spirit he wanted to create. Um, but so yeah, a couple of those casks, you, you, can, you can tell that they were, um, you know, like I said, a little bit hit or miss. But the really interesting thing is this was the time when Patrick was really experimenting with the still and with the wash and everything to get to the sort of modern style of Sullivan's Cove. So this is the very, very first cask of, I guess, what we would think of as modern Sullivan's Cove American oak. Um, like I said, released uh, 2017, so what, 13 years old? And again, much closer in age to what we would usually be bottling these days, usually in that kind of like 10 to 14 year range is pretty standard for us. Just a quick one from Alex there. Was this all down at Cambridge or are you still in the city for the TD001? So um, TD 2014, that's when we moved, sorry, 2004, that's when we moved to Cambridge. So yeah, the distillery existed down in, in Hobart near, the, um, near Sullivan's Cove from 94 to 2003. And then we moved it up to Cambridge in, in 2004. So this would have literally been the first ever cask filled on our current site. Sorry, I'm just gonna, it's, it's been a few years since I've tasted this one. So I'm just gonna stick my schnoz in and see how we go. Me too. There's a, a lightness to this one, a creaminess that hasn't, I haven't tasted yet on the lineup. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Kia, definitely some, it, it, it's got that sort of big, beautiful vanilla slice custody thing that, you know, that's, that's really what we love to see from these American Oak X bourbon casks is all that vanilla and caramel really sort of jumping to the forefront. Definitely with this one, we've still got a little bit of that sort of um, that meatiness to it, that, that little bit of kind of flint, uh, that sort of classic Sullivan's Cove kind of worm tub weight to it. But the spirit itself just has a real uh, sort of liveliness to it still really kind of nice and bright. Again, this one uh, bottled at 47.5%, which is pretty standard for us for our single casks these days. Oh, that's what I forgot to say about the cask strength that we just tasted. People often ask us, because people love cask strength whiskeys, right? People often ask us, why don't you do cask strength whiskeys more often? Or why did you stop doing these ones that you, know, you were doing sort of eight, 10 years ago? Um, like the one that we just tasted. And so I asked Patrick about that because he had stopped doing those 60% bottlings long before I started with Sullivan's Cove. And what he said was he was never really comfortable with the idea of saying cast strength, but having it standardized to 60%. He wanted to be as transparent as possible. But as the whiskeys got older, the natural cast strength really started creeping up and up and up and up and up. Because in Tasmania, we see... Um, in the climactic conditions there, the relatively dry climactic conditions that we have in Tasmania, we lose more water than alcohol over time. So the ABV of the whiskies goes up over time in the same way that it does in Kentucky. Obviously the opposite effect that you have in Scotland where because it's very humid there, you usually see the ABV decrease over time in the cask. So when these whiskies were still, you know, six or seven years old, you could get them to 60% alcohol by just putting a small amount of water in. But the older they got, the more and more the ABV was going up and you had to put more and more water in to get them to 60%, which again, like I said, he wasn't just really comfortable with that, but he also didn't want to be putting whiskeys out onto the market, which was 72% alcohol. He just thought that that would blow people's heads off and, and it really would. Like if we were to do cast strength Sullivan's Cove, a lot of the time it would be well over 70%. And it, to us, that's just not particularly enjoyable. <laughs> um, you know, and obviously people are going to add water to it and stuff like that, but it still comes out of the bottle and comes out of the cask pretty hot. So we're actually not, 
really doctrinaire about the ABVs. Um, if we think something tastes good at 42%, we'll bottle it at 42. If we think it tastes good at 52, we'll bottle it at 52. If we think it tastes good at 60, we'll do it that way. But usually for us, for whatever reason, the sweet spot is right around um, 47 and a half. And you'd probably be uh, pretty surprised at how much time Heather spends doing like 0.1 of a percent ABV trials on something just to always turn around and be like, yeah, 47 and a half is where it's the best. <laughs> um, but we do do that test every single time. It's not like we're just uh, being arbitrary about it. So it's just a question that we get really commonly. Why don't you do the cast strengths anymore? So I thought that was an interesting question to relate to that last whiskey and then coming into these modern styles. What, what else are people saying about this one, Miranda? So we've got vanilla slice on the nose, a great mouthfeel, lanolin, and I love that note of lanolin. Absolutely. Um, Julian is, I think he didn't mean to send this to me privately, but he did. He said much more savory and a lot of depth. And we've got a couple of questions here. Junior, when did the use of the ex bourbon cask start? That was right from the go. Um, I don't know about, yeah, no, right from the, right from the get go, there were um, ex bourbon casks in the mix, as well as those Virgin American oaks that I spoke about. And uh, Kevin is just wanting to clarify, so a HH cask would precede this one. Yes, so HH designation 99 to 2004, and then TD 2004 to 2016, late 2016. Mm. And a quick shout out to Heather. Wikipedia has told us that the genetic analysis has shown a Satuma is a wacky Mandarin Pomelo hybrid. Love that, love that. <laughs> I mean, and that's obviously exactly what I tasted on this whiskey as well. So, yeah, I think we're, we're spot on. Um, I love those tests. Also love having Pat sitting in on the ABV test, sitting back and laughing, saying, I told you so when it's 47.5. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's not that we didn't know it was going to happen. It's just that we want to we wanna go through that exercise. You know, it's important to us to not just make whiskey by the numbers, to really do that really serious kind of... Um, sensory analysis of every single whiskey that we bottle to make sure and and i mean it's funny because sometimes heather will come back and go no this one has to be 47.4 not 0.5 0 0.4 like all right if if that's how it's gonna be the best if that's how it's going to express itself the best then that's what we're going to do um i mean but, it's not just a, a whim thing either it's the chemical composition does change you know by the slightest change in abv you'll get like we could get really geeky with this and I love getting really geeky with this. You know, the, short, lo the long chain S's and the short chain S's will change the stuff that jumps out of you from the glass first. If you add, you know, the tiniest little bit of an increment of water completely switches up. And I really do applaud you guys for doing the test every single time and not just resting on your 47.5 because you know it's good because that is super important because it's chemistry and, you know, it's, it's unpredictable. <laughs> That's it. And you'd be amazed sometimes how you know, a whiskey will just change and drop off right away with like 0.1% um, ABV. You can be like, you know, it can taste absolutely brilliant at 47.6 and then at 47.7, it's like, what happened there? You know what I mean? So yeah. um, really fun for us to sort of see how those chemicals interact and to really make sure that we're, we're getting it right. Um, is, is it, is now, is now when we do intermission, is that the idea? Or are we, do we want to kick on? Um, I think we'll give everybody a little bathroom break if you, if you guys need to refill your water glasses and, and duck up for a second. Um, I've just got a, a short little five minute video here to play for you guys. It's a 25th anniversary video that Sullivan's Co put out because it was their 25th anniversary last year if we didn't already make that, that apparent. So feel free to, to jump up and grab some water if you need to. This isn't anything you can't find on the website. It just goes for about five minutes. So sit back and Enjoy, guys. I'll figure out how to make this full screen in a sec. Sorry. <laughs> Sullivan's Cove was founded back in 1994 and it was set up in Sullivan's Cove, which is the dock area of Hobart. And that's where the name basically came from. The spirit was named after the place it started. 25 years of Sullivan's Cove distillery means a lot of things. It's an important thing. Uh, it means, for me personally, uh, a beautiful exploration um, of what bringing whiskey into a place other than its homeland looks like. 
We get emails and phone calls every day from people all over the world wanting to come and taste our whiskey or to get hold of a bottle. And so that's really exciting because we're bringing something of the beauty of Tasmania and literally distilling it and being able to show it to people all over the world. I started with the distillery back in 1999. We agreed between ourselves, particularly Bill Lark, myself and the other three distillers at the time, that we needed to pay close attention to what we were doing. We needed to make the spirit the best way we could. We've got a very hands-on and nose-on approach to the way that we distill. That's something that hasn't changed, um, but we're really honing in on that. It comes down to having that sense of taste or, or having some idea of what people might like or what might taste good rather than just go by the numbers. I worked for years uh, after that as a distiller and as the manager and as the marketing guy and everything to do with it. I was doing the bottling, uh, you name it, I was doing it. We built it along and we made what we thought was good spirit. We chose barrels based on the way they looked, the way they smelt, on the comments that we got from the, the coopers at the time. And we hoped we were producing something that was pretty good. Well, it turns out years later that that's exactly what we did and we're very happy with the results so far. I suppose over the entire history of the distillery, uh, we've gone from a, a beginnings, like a real humble beginnings of just giving it a go. Later on, uh, one of my cousins came on board, Jacko, otherwise known as Philip Jackson. Um, he came on board and started as a distiller as well. So we trained him up. A few years later, my brother came along, my brother Bruce. So uh, it was almost a family operation by this stage. I've known Patrick for a long time and obviously there was a bit of part-time work going. So um, it's just sort of grown from there. The next big things to happen to, to us here at the distillery that really, um, really got us notoriety, not only in Australia, but around the world, was a, a very surprising thing indeed. And we won the World Whiskies Awards best single malt whiskey in 2014. This is the pinnacle of awards. It's like winning Wimbledon if you're a tennis player. But it was a very big moment for us and, and one that I didn't quite believe. The phone was going off, just ringing flat out. We had people lined up at the door. We had media of all sorts here. It was an incredible day. And then last year, 2018, HH351, an American oak um, version of our whiskey, that won the world's best single cast single malt at the same award. A huge thing for us. That cemented Sullivan's Cove name in the whiskey world. I moved to Tasmania about four years ago with the intention of continuing in the wine industry and then got a little bit distracted when I realised that there's this magical land of whiskey <laughs> called Tasmania. <laughs> My vision for the next 25 years of Sullivan's Cove is building on the hard work uh, that Pat has done. He's done a brilliant job, the proof's in the whisky. We could bottle every barrel that we've got here if we wanted to, and we'd sell it today, but that's not what we do. Um, we allow our, all our barrels to mature properly, and we pick them when they're ready. We're constantly making very, very high quality whisky, and, um, and we're really proud of that. The attitude towards whisky, I think uh, you know, it can be certainly led by, by passion, uh, patience, but then again, just keeping it pretty simple, right? Um, great tasting whiskey. You know, we, we talk about it every single day. What is it? It's, you know, it's whiskey that smells good, tastes great, right? Um, that's kind of great whiskey. I can't see any reason why Sullivan's Cove won't survive another 25 or 50 years. I think, you know, once you get over those first few years of the, the stress of not having anything to sell, um, if you can get past that crux, you know, you know, the whis whiskey industry, or well, it's proven you know, companies that are 200 odd years old, going better than ever. So uh, yeah, I'd say the future's pretty good. How good is that? And some awesome familiar faces there. Yeah, it's a it's a good good little good little record of. I just thought you know it was. 25 years is a big thing for an Australian distillery. There's not many of us that can, uh, that can sort of tick over to something like that. So I wanted to put together a little story about it. That Again, that was obviously made last year. So at that point, Patrick was still a head distiller, whereas you know, now Heather has moved up from, from production manager to head distiller and, and Patrick is sort of taking a, a well-deserved break. But yeah, Jacko is still kicking about. 
doing what he does, making making excellent cups of tea and 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 driving a forklift like a champion among his many 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 other skills. Still good to have him around. All right. So is is everybody back? Should we kick on with some more whiskey? Just give us a thumbs up if you guys are ready to keep drinking. Oh yeah, resounding thumbs up from the team yes. there. Excellent. I can see all of those thumbs. All right, let's get stuck in. So the next whiskey that we have, um, uh, I'm sort of calling modern Sullivan's Cove American Oak. So this again, a 200 liter heavily charred American Oak ex bourbon cask, which we would have gotten sort of straight from Kentucky um, and filled up. And this one trying to, um, I've actually think I've got a bottle of it here. Hang on a sec. Yes, I do. So this one was distilled in 2006, so a couple of years later, um, and then bottled this year, in January of this year. Um, so aged for 13 years. Um, so same age as the one that we just tried, basically. But by this point, really when you start getting up into the TD100s and beyond, you really start to feel like Patrick had absolutely nailed it. And pretty much all of the casks that we taste from that sort of TD100 onwards are pretty tasty. Um, there's, very, there's very few kind of, you know, what we would see as being like, oh, you know, not really sure what was happening on the still that day. It's just like he had really started to nail it and really start to lock down the style. So the big difference for me with this one versus the last one we tasted is that fruit character, right? The American oak is still there, all the caramel is still there, all the vanilla slice is still there, but that beautiful sort of tropical fruit character really starts to come through and just adds a whole nother level. Um, you can also see the texture of this whiskey um, really starting to come to the forefront as well, because again, that previous one that we tried, the TD0001, would have been flocked, whereas this one was not. So we would have left 100% of all of those naturally occurring sort of oils and fats and stuff left dissolved into the whiskey. Um, so that we're really starting to see that big round kind of juicy palette come to the forefront. This cask in particular was um, pretty much we've only released it like through the cellar door and through some wholesale and stuff like that. And we've, we've also been taking it to some tastings, but we never released this sort of online to the general public, but it is, probably our favorite um, American oak cask or one of our favorite American oak casks that we've bottled in the last year. Um, so much so that we have actually entered this one into the World Whiskies Awards. I mean, you know, we enter stuff into the World Whiskies Awards every year, who knows what's gonna happen. But this was the one that we thought out of the sort of lineup of American oak casks that we had to choose from. We were like, yeah, we, we like this one the best and we're pretty happy to put this foot forward. You know, if somebody doesn't like this whiskey, well, really, they don't like Sullivan's Cove. So we're, we're okay with it, you know. Um, these, these are my absolute favorite Sullivan's Cove whiskeys. This kind of modern uh, TD era American oak, the stuff that we're bottling right now, that's in that kind of 10 to 14 year range, but is really fruit forward. I absolutely love it. We've got, yeah, some white flowers and stuff like that happening in there as well. Um, and the thing that I really love about this whiskey is, again, you know, uh, Australian craft beer has got quite a good reputation globally now. And the style that we're really known for internationally is Australian pale ale, which has got that real sort of tropical fruit note to it. And I think that this whiskey is a pretty good reflection of that in terms of how we make our wash using those long fermentation times, really trying to get that tropical fruit note coming to the forefront. Um, and the way that we run our stills these days, as Heather said, is sort of low and slow and all about uh, trying to sort of preserve that fruit character and then just layer the oak on top of it rather than having it kind of come and, uh, come and blitz it out. I could talk about a whiskey like this for a really long time. These are just my absolute favorites. I'm really glad that I still have a bottle of this at home to keep me company during the last couple of weeks of lockdown. Well, thanks so much for, for putting this on the lineup, Fred. This is an absolute banger. Not at all. Yeah, we've, we've had fun playing with this one this year. Like I said, we, you know, usually when we release stuff online, it sells out really quickly. So it's nice that we actually sort of kept a few of these bottles behind so that we could, you know, sell a couple to our favorite bars, sell, uh, Ali can sell some through the cellar door and that we've still got a few to bring to tastings and things like that. So we've got a couple of awesome tasting notes coming in here. We've got the grilled pineapple cheesecake is a resounding favorite tasting note from the chat. I got to agree with you there, Kia, that is an awesome note. 
Absolutely. Fruity Tootie, milk, milk bottles, lollies, and roasting chestnuts. Alex has a quick question here. Is there a specific bourbon cask that lends itself better to Sullivan's Cove New Make, say, you know, Heaven's Hill? That's, um, that's actually, it's a really good question because I think that for a long time, like a lot of Australian distillers, we were trying to get what we were given, you know what I mean? But I think that in the last few years, we've really started to put a little bit more kind of rigor into that and trying to figure out which casks work the best for us. Um, I think that Heather can probably give you some more details or at least this as many details as she's willing to, as she's willing to divulge. What do you reckon, HT? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Fred. I think in the past, like like most other distilleries in Australia, we we definitely were quite opportunistic with the barrels that we got. And so a lot of the early casks were Jim Beam or Jack Daniels, which are the most readily available um, bourbon or American bourbon style whiskey casks around there um, and available. Uh, but in more recent years, we have really honed in. Um, our bond store is full of a broad range of bourbon casks. There's everything from Heaven Hill through Elijah Craig, um, Wild Turkey, um, Eagle Rare, there's a buff bunch of buffaloes in there. Like there's loads, there's a big spectrum of them. Um, and because we've been going for a good 25 years, we've been able to kind of look at across, across the spectrum and see what's worked and what's not. So um, in more recent years, we've really honed it in. So yes, there are types that suit the spirit better, but I'm not gonna tell you, sorry. <laughs> That's good. We always, I always enjoy um, the guys down at the distillery have been, uh, you know, trying to keep me entertained while I've been locked down in Melbourne and they've been sending me little videos of when the shipping containers show up full of bourbon casks and, you know, Ali will send me a video and say, I wish you were here so that you could smell it. You know, this amazing smell that comes out of these shipping crates after they've been around the world with these big bourbon casks sitting in them and just the smell that comes out. I, I always get like a, a flurry of excited text messages from the distillery on, on cask delivery day. So that's really good fun. And it is so much fun to sort of sit there thinking like, that's really exciting, right? Because, um, you know, guys like Heather and Rich who are actually making the whiskey today and filling up those casks, they're going to uh, um, like work that stuff for at least 10 years. But it's great to sort of see that excitement of like, what's this gonna taste like 10 years from now and how good is this cask and how good is this spirit and how much fun will it be to sort of see that develop. Um, again, it is obviously one of the great advantages of, of uh, Sullivan's Cove that we have been around for 25 years. So we can sort of see that history and, and think about, you know, what, uh, what Patrick Maguire was doing when, uh, when Kevin Rudd was prime minister and, and uh, what Bill was doing in the, in the last century when some of this early stuff was distilled. Um, so for the, for the last two whiskeys, I'm actually gonna switch up the order on you guys. So uh, if we can have number six first, and this is the one that's gonna be your full nip for the evening. So you can obviously come back to it later, but I, I want us to sort of stick our noses and, and get our palates around this one um, a little bit first, because it is still uh, a, a little bit of a lighter style before we kind of get into something a little bit heavier to finish up with. By the way, cheers to Fred for ensuring that everybody had a full nip in their event pack tonight. That was all you, Fred, and thank you very much for that. Oh, it's my pleasure. We, we, we do like sharing as, as much as it's difficult sometimes. We like to share as much as we can. Um, I guess before we get stuck into this one, Ali, do you have any thoughts about how, like, about how that sort of American oak style has developed through those last three whiskeys that we tasted from the sort of HH to the early TD to the kind of more modern ones? Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. You're going from that kind of bigger, more rustic spirit to that slightly more kind of um, fine-tuned style. And then that modern one just hits you with that that tropical fruit, orchard fruit um, uh, kind of bomb. So, yeah, really, really cool to see that progression and that change kind of occur. Um, but, yeah, awesome to try it in a lineup like that and see that. It's really cool. Definitely. No one here in the chat has just said four different whiskeys and four different tastes. That's it. E even though like a lot of the way that they were made is, is sort of quite similar. Um, so this is the whiskey that I wanted us to taste next. Number six, uh, Sullivan's Cove American Oak Refill, which is 14 years old. Um, the reason I wanted us to taste this next is because this relates back to the first whiskey that we tasted. Think about those big old... Um, 300 litre virgin American oak casks that had not been charred, that had only been toasted. 
after the whiskey was decanted out of those because whiskey barrels are expensive and so it's good to try to reuse them when you can after that initial batch of whiskey was decanted you know somewhere between being two and five years old those casks were then taken back to the cooperage they were charred on the inside and then they were refilled with sullivan's cove new make again and this whiskey is the result four years later so one of those big old 300 liter american oak casks charred and then refilled with Sullivan's Cove new make and then allowed to sit for 18 years. So we actually had to create a new label for this whiskey. Um, it's the one that's, that's a, a black label with a big sort of pinkish brown stripe through it because we couldn't call this an ex-bourbon cask because this cask has literally never seen bourbon in it. It was produced in Australia specifically for Sullivan's Cove and the only previous fill was an earlier batch of Sullivan's Cove. So this in the, the whiskey is uh, the cask has spent its entire life aging Sullivan's Cove whiskey. This is just round two, but because it had been charred in the interim, there are still some virgin oak characteristics to it. So the the flavour profile to me ends up being somewhere in between a refill bourbon cask, which you see very commonly in Scotch whiskey, and a virgin oak cask because it does because it, it, it was only sort of charred after the first fill you do still get some of those kind of fresh oak characteristics to it. Um, so again, you know, such a fun thing to be able to play with. 2020 is the first time that we've released American Oak Refill. It's been kind of our big sort of special release for the year because we have identified a couple of different casts of this style that were sort of ready to go. Um, so it's been something that we've been talking about a fair, amid, a fair bit and trying to bring to tastings and stuff. But this is the very first time ever that we've put this one up against one of the original whiskies that would have been aged in these casks as well. Uh, so a really, really fun thing to be able to taste those next to each other. I mean, the amount of uh, how important the first whiskey is on this lineup to the very last whiskey. I, I just said it in the chat there, but I don't think I've ever experienced quite a full circle tasting experience like this before. This is really something special. Good. Glad you think so. And this one, like this, this one's interesting because that, that oak is really, it's, it's coming to the forefront a little bit more, but you're almost getting this beautiful sort of like caramel sauce with a bit of kind of black tea tannin on the finish. Almost. It's not nearly that same kind of, uh, you, you know, more sort of drier herbal tannin than you would expect from a European oak, but it does have those nice kind of old tea leaves uh, and tobacco that really just sort of carries it through the finish. Um, and again, you know, 14 years old for us is, you know, it's on, the, it's on the older side, but it's not out of control. Like I said, standard, pretty standard for us is going to be between 10 and 14 years. And again, if you guys ever see a bottle of Sullivan's Cove and you want to know how old it is, just look at the little side tag, that little white sticker that you can see in the middle of your tasting mat on the, on the side of the American Oak bottle. And what that says is the exact um, fill date and decant date. So you literally know down to the day how old the whiskey is. You know, it's funny, people often talk about Sullivan's Cove as being a no age statement whiskey, which I guess technically is true because we don't have a 10, 11, a 12, whatever on the bottle. Um, but transparency is a really big deal for us. We always want people to know exactly what they're drinking. So each of those side tags will always have a unique bottle number, a unique cask number, and then the exact sort of fill and decant dates. Um, so yeah, this one, 14 years old, which is pretty cool. Not a lot of 14 year old refill casks kicking around in Australian single malt. Mm -hmm. And definitely not a lot of them that taste like this. Um, James there is just wondering, how do you approach maturation of a refill cask compared to a fresh one? Well, again, with these ones, I don't think we really knew how they were going to turn out. It's, um, you know, they're 300 litres, so they're quite big. So you can expect it to take a while. Um, you know, it, it had been filled with whiskey previously, but again, it was, it was charred in between those two fills. So, you know, it could have gone either way. It could have been the type of thing that would have been ready in sort of nine, 10 years, um, which a lot of our sort of standard American Oak Tex bourbon casks were, or it could have been like this, where it really sort of needed that extra time in that big cask to kind of um, come to its come to its peak, uh, Heather. Do you have any ideas about that? About how these how these refill casks have been treating us in general? Because I feel like we do need to let them sit for a little bit longer, don't we? Yeah, they're really interesting casks because you know when we think about whiskey, we're always in our head thinking, okay, so it's a single malt or it's a blend. So then you kind of categorize it in one part of your brain. Then you think. Oh, what kind of oak was it? Was it American oak? Was it European oak? And that kind of further categorizes it in your brain. 
But a lot of what we think about when we think of a whiskey is the pre-fill of the cask. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the most part of the whiskies in the world, it's bourbon or a fortified. But this one doesn't have the pre-fill element, which is a really interesting thing. And it's taken, it, it took us a, a, a good year and a half or so of, cons of regularly tasting these to really get our head around these. So I feel like the, in answer to your question, James, um, it's not so much a different approach of maturation um, because what's going on in the cask is still the same thing. It's our, our mindset that changes. It's our approach that changes when we're tasting it. Uh, and the, these are actually some of my favourite casks um, in our bond store, hands down, because you see the harmony clearer. You, th you have more clarity when you're looking at the effect, impact of the oak and of the, our spirit. And so you see the DNA, our fingerprint of our spirit, a whole lot more clearer in these casks because you don't have the fortified or the, the bourbon influence in there. So it's this really cool, almost sort of more pure expression of Sullivan's Cove spirit. And it's the textures there. It's a really it's textbook Sullivan's Cove texture spirit, really, really big malt bomb, lots of fruity stuff going on there. And you get, interestingly, there is, um, and this, this played with our brains, there are some notes in there that you think, oh, it tastes a little bit sugary, a bit, you know, like, pomegranate molasses or a little bit um, toffee-like and you think, oh, that must be a pre-fill, but no, that's coming from uh, the barrel itself because it's been toasted and, re and charred. And so you do naturally have some sugars in the timber that are being caramelized and you've got vanillin coming through from the American oak. So it, it twists in your brain and it really makes you think, but I think it's something that we should be doing more of in the industry um, to highlight craft distilling as in the crafting of a spirit. And this is, this is where you really see it quite, quite clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some absolutely. fantastic comments that were made by Alex. One, one earlier, and I think, it, I think this was from Alex, who said one of my favorite tasting notes for Sullivan's Cove is multi goodness. And I think that lends just to what you're saying there, Heather, you know, let that spirit sing, let that spirit character sing. And um, he's also said here, less places to hide in a refill. <laughs> and, and I appreciate that too. <laughs> um, I think we had one question yes here from mark and it's not a novice question at all how often or long can you reuse a cask when does the wood become a bit too tired and and you know how do you gauge that kind of thing i think that you know it certainly in my experience it really kind of depends on what you're going for i think that um you know if you're planning on aging something for a really 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 long time then you could use a cask that might have been filled three or four or five times if really you're just almost using it as um a vessel for the spirit itself to mature and go through all of those kind of oxidative reactions and filtration reactions and things, as opposed to trying to inject flavor from the cask into the whiskey. It's almost like there are two different phases of maturation. The first one is the kind of additive phase where the cask is, you know, um, having an impact like adding flavor into the whiskey itself. And then the next one is really all about how the spirit kind of interacts with itself and interacts with the air, um, the texture that forms and stuff. So if you're, if you're aiming for a cask forward or an oak forward final product, then you obviously need to use a cask that's still pretty active and got some flavor. But if you're really wanting to sort of just lay something down and, and let it sit for a long time to have the spirit itself develop, you can use something quite a few times before it's completely cactus, I think. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for Heather to give me the thumbs up on that answer because... <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're massive, big wood vessels. Like, you can use them indefinitely. But it, again, each time you're going to get a different result. So you really just have to think about um, what your desired spirit is. Um, so in essence, they're like a tea bag, really. You know, you chuck your spirit in there. It sucks out a whole lot. And um, yeah, you put the, the, some more spirit back in the next round, but there won't be as much to extract unless you refurbish. Um, which is what's happened in the case of this whiskey. So you do get, um, you know, a fresh layer of charcoal, uh, which acts as a, the filtering component of the maturation. But then you've also reactivated a whole new layer of oak by toasting it and, and toasting it very specifically to get um, certain flavours through. Yeah. And I, I love what you said before, Heather, about this one with the sort of, with the maltiness as, as well as the oak, because... The, the malt just sort of picked up that oak character and absolutely sprinted off into the distance with it with this one. You just see the two things just just coming together so nicely and, and really carrying each other through the like through the different phases of the whiskey. There's nothing about it where sort of oak and malt are clashing against each other. 
they're, yeah, like I said, they're, they're definitely just like two cow people riding off into the sunset with this one, I think. Um, I'm just going to jump in really quickly here and pop some bottle shop links into the chat because it seems that everybody is too quick for me. I was going to wait to post them at the end to not detract from the, the chat here, but people are already onto it and purchasing. So there you go. We've got the Sullivan's Cove Refill American Oak, which we were just speaking about there. The Sullivan's Cove Special Cask, which we are yet to taste, I believe, Fred. That's up next. That's up next. And then we've got the Fire Drum Vodka as well. There you go. So we, we, we were able to find a couple of bottles for you guys this evening, which is nice. I so appreciate that. Thank you. And there was a couple of bottles, and I'm very sorry about this, everybody. There was a couple of bottles of the TD0165, but they got snatched up before I got a chance to post the link. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, if, if everyone's happy for me to move on, or do we need to give everyone a minute to try to fight over the bottles in the bottle shop? Oh, I, I think we can move on. Let's go ahead. So the, um, the next one that we have is uh, Sullivan's Cove Special Cask. Um, the Special Cask is the, is the green label. I don't know if you guys have seen that one. Um, I can pull up a picture of it for you. Oh, you got it there? There you go. There you go. So it's a little dark, but it's actually, it's actually a dark green label. And so the, the green label special cask, we basically use that as an in-house independent bottling is kind of how you can think of it. When we find really interesting, unique casks that sit sort of outside of our core range of American oak ex bourbon or French oak ex tawny, something that's just a little bit left field, a little bit different, um, that we really only have one or possibly two casks of. And we also think that it's absolutely delicious, then we will use the green label for it. So with something like um, with the American Oak Refill, we did actually, you know, sort of, we, we do actually have kind of a, a handful of those in the Bond store. Um, whereas with the special casks, it's usually like literally only one or two casks of that particular style that exist in the entire Sullivan's Cove warehouse. And so when we find those, we obviously think that's pretty cool. They're usually uh, unique, yeah, stuff that we've never released before, styles that we've never released before. And again, to get that green label, they really have to have sort of outstanding scores from our internal tasting panel as well. Um, this one in particular, TD0214 uh, was released exclusively as a cellar door. Um, so not something that we ever kind of put up online for sale. And uh, it was released in February of this year. And it is a first fill American Oak X Apera. So, um, and, and, and you know, an American Oak cask, but that's previous fill was Australian sherry style fortified wine. So usually um, we don't use a lot of Apera casks at all at Sullivan's Cove. We tend to focus more on the 20 port style. Uh, but when we do every once in a while come across an Apera cask, um, they tend more often than not to be European Oak. So this one is, is, again, it's just a little bit of a left field cast. Um, trying to think if I have 281 bottles altogether of this one were produced. And I'm trying to remember, 45.8%. And I don't exactly have the, do you have the, the fill and decant dates there, Miranda, so we can tell how old it is? Filled on the 7th of the 11th, 07, Kevin 07, back at it again and decanted on the 15th of the 10th, 2019. There you go. So 12 years old. And obviously just a really interesting combination of that sort of bright, fresh, sort of vanilla and caramel and, and sort of sawdust American oak with that, um, with that Australian <laughs> cherry style fortified wine. And we just think, you know, we, when it comes to special casks, we just want them to be fun. We want them to be interesting. We obviously want them to be delicious. A little bit lighter on the ABV with this one, 45.8%. And that's obviously, as you can see, you know, Heather doing her thing and, and, and really sort of getting pretty granular about, um, you know, about, about making sure that we dilute something to exactly where it's going to sit the best. And, and the cool thing about this one is like, obviously you know, despite the fact that that's a fortified wine cask, you can tell by the color that it's still not absolutely blitzed with that fortified wine character. We're still talking about a large format cask, 12 years old. So the spirit is still absolutely doing just as much of the talking as the previous fill here. And again, 
in terms of this entire tasting, that's really the point of why we use those American oak casks in those large formats, why we deliberately make a big sort of rustic style of spirit, we use that worm tub condenser, and then we just age it for long enough so that it starts tasting good. You know, I think that a lot of Sullivan's Cove whiskies, if you tried to bottle them at two, three, four, five years old, they probably wouldn't express themselves very well because a lot of those bigger, media, denser characteristics, they need more time in the cask to sort of clean up. But when they do get to that point, the level of complexity that you end up with at the end of the day is, is kind of next level in my mind. Obviously, I'm a bit biased, but I think this stuff's delicious. And I think everybody is agreeing with you there, Fred. The comments, we, we didn't have any tasting notes in the beginning. It's just, wow, oh my God, amazing, favorite, wow. And now we've got some tasting notes coming through. After the first sip, I feel like I just walked into a sawmill. I do get that initially, but then doesn't it just kind of pop and fade and kind of subdue into that really like chocolatey, leathery, almost a little bit meaty, taste is subjective, that's just myself. And then we've got Kia with blueberry pancakes and candied bacon. I've been loving your tasting notes tonight, Kia. Absolutely nailing it. Yeah, the blueberry pancakes is a great call, but with some of those little burnt bits of maple syrup around the edge of it as well, you know, a little bit of sort of brown butter and maple syrup happening. Yeah. I love when some of these, so, so Sullivan's Cove, we never use any form of peat or smoke or anything in our, um, in our grains, in our wash. But with some of these fortified wine casks in particular, they do get quite heavily charred before we fill them up with spirit. So you get this wonderful sort of, um, yeah, burnt sugar, almost barbecued meat, type of caramelization happening on the inside of that cask. Um, you know, I think that I've, I've only made a couple of trips to our Coopers, but, you know, Heather obviously likes to go and visit them as often as she can. And when, when you see them sort of toasting the inside of these casks, charring the inside of these casks, and you get these amazing sort of, you know, just roasted meat and, and things being, you know, I remember last time I was there, I was, uh, there was one particular cask that was being prepared and it reminded me of like, um, pulling a tray of roasted lamb out of the oven when it was still piping hot and just pouring a bunch of fortified wine over it to deglaze the pan. I don't know yeah. if that's something anyone else has ever done, but just all of those kind of beautiful fortified wine and, and roasted meat vapors kind of coming off and that little bit of char that you get that just like absolutely makes the salivary crazy. Um, and you can, you can see it in this whiskey and spades, that, that lovely sort of charred note from the inside of that fortified wine cask. Fun stuff. I think that's something that is true for most fortified wine styles because it's a, it's a common theme that I've seen in heavily charred Apera that you will get that toasty, toasty note that comes through quite specifically with Apera. Yeah. I mean, we don't see it all the time. I think that, you know, some of our um, X20 casks, they're, like the Tawny character is actually quite clean and that we don't see quite as much of that sort of um, that roasty toasty thing, but in, in certain casks, absolutely. Mm. Um, Heather, do you think that's just the way that the Coopers are preparing them or do you think it's about how the spirit sort of picks that up and interacts with it? Uh, I think there is uh, definitely a uh, sort of toffied uh, caramel flavour that is very quintessentially Sullivan spirit um, mm -hmm. because we've got in, our, in the bottom of our still, our heating source is actually internal elements. So there is a... Uh, it's not like a direct fired still, as you talk about, like you hear in Scotch, but there is a very intense space of heat at the bottom. And so you do get a touch of that Maillard reaction happening in the still. So there's a touch of that, but a lot of it, the majority of it comes from the cooperage. So yeah. that's, that's very particular uh, uh, toasting styles there that are coming through. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. I, I think I've said to you in the past that sometimes, um, you know, you can tell, uh, with the spirit kind of how long it's been since the elements have been cleaned because towards the end of the cleaning cycle, they do start to get that beautiful kind of like, um, like toasty sort of character to them as, as you see some of that kind of Maillard reaction happening in the bottom of the still and that's always good fun. Hey, I'm just going to jump in here quickly, guys, because it is 8.17, 8.15 is usually when we like to wrap up the formal portion of our virtual events. So just know that you have tasted all of the whiskies with us and you have all of the important information. If you've got dinner in the oven or a little one to get to bed or, or anything that you need to do, um, I'd just like to thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're going to be hanging out here for the next half an hour or so. And if you need access to this event, the recording will be up on our YouTube channel shortly. So a massive, massive thank you to Fred Siggins, to all of the Sullivan's Cove crew for joining us tonight. Really, really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your evening. Um, and cheers to those that have to bounce off. Sanjava. 
and I'm excited to, to kick around and finish the rest of my whiskeys with you guys. What do you reckon? Yeah, absolutely. I'm keen. Um, thank you so, so much for having us. Thank you for everyone who joined in. It's like, it's a massive group today and that's, that's great. That's uh, really, really humbling and special for us to be able to sort of bring these whiskeys to, to as many people as possible via this format. So thank you all for taking time out of your Thursday night to show up. Um, like Miranda said, we're going we're gonna, to um, stick around and finish the rest of our whiskeys and have a chat and answer some questions and stuff like that. But yeah, hopefully you guys can sort of see from this whole thing a little bit of the evolution of the Sullivan's Cove American Oak style and that real style of how we kind of like to put that spirit to the forefront and allow it to really do the talking as much as possible. Um, next time for round two, we're going to focus more on the double cask vatted expression that we put out and also on some of our French oak casks. And we're really going to go over basically the, the evolution of a couple of those different casks and how, um, how we sort of make decisions about the whiskies that we're going to continue making versus sometimes when we decide that we're going to change things. Uh, but apart from that, cheers, guys. Cheers. And thank you to the guys that are jumping off now. That really lovely comment came in just then from, from Paxton. So thank you so much for joining us. And to everybody, thank you very much again. I'm really excited to circle back to the earlier glasses though to see how they've changed. I think they've changed so much, Miranda. You get go. I've, I just went back to the um, Millennium Gold recently, mm -hmm. and it smells all um, all vegetal and you know really sort of um, like really um, cereally sort of crude grain. To be honest, at the start there, mm -hmm. uh, and and then as we uh, move along, that it, it really you know progresses in in a level of complexity. I think that's really where we've sort of managed. Um, managed to sort of see the changes tonight. So it's been awesome. For sure. And we've actually just had a great comment that I want to call attention to there. Gully said, when is the next Whiskey Now at Sullivan's Cove bottling? The first one was amazing. Guys, we haven't even humble bragged about our own double cask tonight. What, what are we <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, that was like one of the greatest, um, like not accidental, but one of the most sort of surprise successes. Like I think that, yeah, both Heather and I had so much fun with that one. And that's one of my all-time favorite whiskeys, to be honest. And I'm not just saying that because it was a whiskey number bottling. Jules can vouch for this. I really did love that whiskey. It's such a pleasure to drink. So uh, Rich has still got some. Is it empty, Rich? No, um, there's still some in there. Cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, 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 Miranda, am I allowed to give like a very, a very small sneak preview? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So... One of the things that that whiskey and almond bottling resulted in, we loved the style that came out of that so much that when we made our hundredth ever batch of double cask and we did that as a special release in a, in a wooden box sort of commemorating the hundredth ever batch of double cask that we made, we called that, you know, DC 100 for obvious reasons. And um, we sort of based that almost on the whiskey and almond bottling. Like, so it ended up being, you know, it was a larger batch, but it ended up being quite a similar style. And that is going to be on the tasting lineup for the next. We don't have any more of the whiskey and almond bottlings to share, but we do have a couple of DC 100s left that, um, that we might crack open for the next tasting. And that is gonna be Sullivan's Cove edition two. There's only two editions of this tasting because there's only so much museum stock that we can <laughs> we can ask Fred to open for us. So it's we'll be more Sam and Adam get mad at me. <laughs> we'll be put, putting that one out soon. If you guys are just stay tuned to the EDM as usual, you'll be the first to know. Oh, a couple of people have a full bottle of a, a double cask sitting at home. That is awesome. You've you've managed to hold on to it. You're you're a better man than I. Mm. So what's everybody thinking of their earlier glasses? I'm going back into that Millennium Gold, like Julian was saying, and that, that crude grain character you were talking about is quite real, isn't it? Well, that, that real vegetal thing as well, it's almost like, uh, like veggie stock, like veggie stock cubes is, is kind of coming out, which I think is really interesting. But um, yeah, again, you know, the texture on it and the sort of sweetness and the grain characters are, are really sort of surprisingly pleasant, I think, for such a young Sullivan's Cove. Mm. Absolutely. And um, we've just had... Mitchell here has just, uh, I'm asking, can someone please shed some info on the Exile whiskey that was from Sullivan's Cove? That's a flashback, isn't it? So um, Exile was an independent bottling of Sullivan's Cove. So that was not actually like under the Sullivan's Cove label. It was a, a privately owned cask 
that somebody, you know, bottled under their own, like, like a lot of um, distilleries in the early days, Sullivan's Cove sold quite a lot of casks of young whiskey to private owners um, as a way to sort of help fund the, the distillery in the early times. And so that would have just been one of those casks. I know that one of them that I tasted was, uh, I believe it was like a 14 year old French Oak X Tawny, but I know that there were a couple of different editions of the Exile. But yeah, in independent independent bottling or, or private bottling or however you want to call it. So I hadn't necessarily been through the Sullivan's Cove kind of um, standard process of how we go about selecting and bottling our casks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I've got a question here from Beatrix. Beatrix has a barrel of Sullivan's Cove hanging out. And sorry, I'm just reading this through really quickly. Just asking for advice here. Should we drink it? If so, when? It was amazing when we first received it. A barrel or a bottle here, Beatrix? Feel free to take yourself on mute and, and have a chat, guys. It's just a few of us now. Uh, in bottle, in bottle, Beatrix. I reckon, you know, if, if you loved it when you got it, crack it, drink it. Yeah, look, we always, we, always, we always tell people we make the stuff so that people can drink it. You know, that, that's, I think, our, our major motivation as producers is that we want people to open those bottles and, um, and get their faces in and, and have a good time with it. Um, but yeah, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna get any better sitting on the shelf, that's for sure. You know, we know that, that whiskey doesn't really mature or change in the same way that wine does sitting in your cellar. And certainly if the bottle has already been opened, then I would say, especially with something like Sullivan's Cove that hasn't basically been filtered to buggery and had a bunch of other stuff done to it, you know, once it's open, try to drink it within a couple of months. Um, and especially if you get down to that last couple of nips in the bottom of your bottle, you know, definitely go for it. Um, because we do notice with a, with a whiskey like Sullivan's Cove that's completely unfiltered, sometimes it does start to go a little bit strange and watery if you just leave those last couple of nips sitting around in the bottom of the bottle. So yeah, once you get past halfway, especially just, yeah, just knock it off, get it done. <laughs> there you go. Beatrix has said great advice. Thank you. It wouldn't last more than a month. <laughs> there you go. You're my kind of person. Uh, we had a quick question here from Gully, the world whiskey awards winner with a HH barrels. Do you think one DC barrel is going to win soon? Well, they've been, they've applied, haven't they? We put well, forward. Well, so interestingly, I mean, and so, so when we say DC, that actually doesn't refer to the time at which it was produced. That's just what we call all of our double cask batches, which is the vatted expression that we make. So it's only with the single cask stuff that those first two letters at the start of the barrel number tell you kind of when in the history of Sullivan's Cove it was made. But interestingly, if you look at the sort of history of some of the awards that we've picked up over the last few years, we had HH525 French Oak in 2014, HH351 in um, 2018, but last year in 2019, uh, one of our TD casks of French Oak also won world's best single cask, single malt. So we've, you know, we've, we've picked up some pretty serious awards throughout the range. And interestingly enough as well, um, in 2018, when that uh, 351 won world's best single cask, uh, one of the double casks that we entered also won best Australian single malt, but nobody paid attention because we won world's best single cask at the same time. <laughs> so nobody really paid attention to that best in Australia award that happened for one of our DCs. So look, you know, I think that Sullivan's Cove fans and people who have been drinking our whiskey for a long time like to argue the merits of, you know, HH versus TD and all that kind of stuff. But really, we're, we're pretty proud of all of it. There are some sort of differences between those two different styles of whiskey. But obviously, we're, we're pretty committed to that style um, that, that we, you know, that we think of as the kind of modern Sullivan's Cove style. And, and it's certainly, um, certainly done pretty well in the awards as well. I feel like I'm rapid firing at you now, but the questions are coming out and I'm loving it. Um, Jules, Jules has asked, PB cask number, is that Peter Bignall? PB? No, that, that means it was uh, privately owned. Ah, there you go. Is that right, Heather? Yeah. So that means it's it's not owned by Sullivan's Cove. It's just something that we we were storing at our warehouse on behalf of of you know a private investor, basically. Great. If I, if I may, I, I'm uh, I'm an owner of one of the personal uh, cask oh, here. Okay. I'm not sure if that's gonna. There we go. I've got a couple uh, that we bought into it as a tontine a few years ago. Actually, I think it's almost ten years ago now. Yeah, great. Um, I've still got a couple of bottles. And it's 
yeah, it's remarkable. And, and thank you again for, for tonight's tasting. I think it's, you know, for us that, that have enjoyed Sullivan's Cove over the years, I'm a mainlander, I'm a you know, Melbourneian at heart, but I was able to even go down, um, I think when, uh, uh, I think it was Tyrone was working, Saladorno, I'm sure he was still there, but, um, you know, taste it during the process of it being, you know, matured. It was just, it was just an incredible process. So um, thank you again for, uh, for uh, bringing us in. But um, I just wanted to, wanted to ask you, like, what can you really tell me about these, these personal casks um, versus the ones that you actually, you know, make the, um, the bulk of, of your storage in? Well, it, it depends. We've gone through a couple of different phases with those. Like I said, in the very early days, like a lot of distilleries, we were selling a fair number of full-size casks, um, you know, a, to be able to get some cash flow in the door. Um, and, and that continued on. I'm not sure when the last full-size cask we would have sold would have been, but then also between 2014 and 2016, we had the Seller Masters program, which were small format casks. So, um, you know, much less money up front, but you got much less whiskey out of them and they aged much quicker. So depending on what sort of era you were talking about, did you guys buy into a full size cask or was it one of the little 20 litre ones? No, it was a 20 litre, but with COVID, uh, everything feels like it's, everything was like 25 years ago. So, uh, yeah. you know, well, <laughs> that was real. I think it was really about um, uh, 2017, actually, we got it. So it wasn't, it wasn't really that long ago. Yeah, so that would have been part of the Seller Masters program that we were doing yep. during, during those couple of years um, where we basically filled up 20 litre casks for people and then bottled them a couple of years later. So some really delicious and interesting whiskies that came out of that program, but really quite different to um, the sort of standard Sullivan's Cove style that we would normally bottle. Like I said, full size casks and matured for sort of minimum nine or 10 years. Um, but cool. I'm really glad you guys are enjoying it. And yeah, thanks, oh, for, uh, thanks for your yeah. support. For coming down and ties ties a distiller now by the look yeah. of it. So Richard's just said that. That's that's yeah. fantastic. Thanks for letting me know, Ty. That's well, good. Yeah, yeah, Richard. I say, like Ty started out in in the cellar door, and actually a lot of our production crew right now sort of started out, um, you know, doing tours and tastings and stuff in the cellar door, and then um, yeah, decided that they wanted to be distillers. So there's a few of them out there now. Every once in a while, if you're really lucky, Ty will still do a do the occasional tour. I think. If the other guys oh, tour. Are, yeah, cool. they need him to step in um, and he's, he's absolutely brilliant at it when you get him talking. Thanks again. Cheers. We just had um, some, some patrons ask there in the comments if Whiskey and Almond is going to be open amidst the new restrictions and I would love to say that yes we are. From November 6th we are taking table bookings by OB. We've got a very limited capacity unfortunately which is 10 people in our little bar at one time. We're doing table bookings of two hours so Grab your friends, come down. You can hang out with us for two hours. And it, it, yeah, it's, it's going to be great. I, I can't wait for these walls to be filled again with people enjoying their whiskey and, and loud music and loud voices. It's going to be just an absolute dream. So yeah, head to, head to, if you're not subscribed to the EDM, which you should be, you should have an email in your inbox today with a link to table bookings. I believe Jules, did that go out today? Yeah, it did. Hey, Miranda, can you just take that down to nine people capacity so I can just have one permanent seat? That... <laughs> yeah. 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 There's always room for you in the back room, Fred. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Just hide me out the back where I can't cause any trouble. That's good. <laughs> I think I missed a question up here earlier. By the way, guys, do feel free to unmute yourselves and just jump in and ask a question if you have it directly to the guys. I, uh, I wanted to um, sort of really um, pay tribute to um, the uh, the patience and restraint and vision of um, the early um, distillers and um, people that were laying down casks at Sullivan's Cove because, you know, in uh, the year 2000 and 2005, 2010, everyone was still laying down 20 litre casks and, and um, the restraint um, of the people that were sort of um, looking at casks in 2010, 2012, 2013 even, um, was, was completely different. They were just trying to put anything in a bottle they could um, that, that, you know, had some flavour to it. And uh, I think that the, the, uh, the, the way that this brand has, has developed has been in a completely different mindset that, you know, we're in this for, for time, we're in this for the long game and that, you know, this can't be done overnight. I think that's um, something that they realized really early on. And uh, I really want to um, 
yeah, pay tribute to that. And I, I'm, I'm really impressed actually that every time I chat to Patrick, I sort of say, yeah, this is the guy that, that time doesn't, doesn't really affect. He, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't pay attention to it just a bit longer, a bit longer, not ready yet. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And it's like, it, it's such an amazing thing. Cause I think that if you think about, you know, Patrick who first started working at the distillery in 1999, and really struggled to make ends meet for 15 years, right? Until we won that first big award in 2014. And he just refused to budge. He was just, nah, this is how I'm going to do it. And if, if I have to sell, you know, 90% of what we produce to France, which we were doing at one point, and if he has to go around uh, with a suitcase and try to sell the stuff himself, then he'll do it. And I think that Heather and I and the rest of the, of the team who are obviously a bit younger have, have benefited so much from kind of absorbing that attitude of just like, yeah, it's not about, it's not about short term gains. We'll, we'll take the time to do it. Right. And that's kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a nice thing to be a part of. Cause again, you, you see it really having some longevity and, and again, the whiskeys that we're making now, we're like, you know, who knows if we'll still be working for Sullivan's Cove at the time when those actually finally get bottled and all that kind of thing. But it's really nice to think about, Hopefully we're making stuff that 10, 15 years from now, somebody else is going to think is delicious. Absolutely. That does actually circle back to the question that I think I missed. Um, I think it was from James and he said, is there um, a characteristic or that you look for in a cask that you want to bottle as say 18, old and rare, you know, that you know it will go the extra mile. Sorry, I think I butchered it there, but I couldn't find the actual question. So are you talking about specifically for the really, really old ones or just for our casks in general? I think for whiskeys that are intended to be the 18, Old and rare? Yeah. The thing that you look for in the maturation process? Um, I mean, I'm sure Heather can offer some details for that, but I think for us, you know, it's like a cask will tell us when it's ready. It, it really will. And sometimes it just takes a little bit longer. And sometimes you taste something at 14, 15 years old and you might be like, yeah, look, this is pretty delicious, but I think that we can, I think that we can get this to go a little bit further. Um, or maybe there's just something about it that goes, yeah, it just needs a little bit more texture, a little bit more time. Um, I, I feel like at that point, it is a little bit more kind of art and feel than it is science that we're necessarily looking for a specific characteristic. But yeah, like I said, Heather, what do you reckon? I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think it's the same approach as we have with all of our whiskies in that we, we're listening to the the whiskey and waiting for us to, to tell us when its balance point is, when it's in harmony. But for those old ones particularly, I mean, a lot of the casks won't make it that long, uh, but it's a very particular kind of style you're after, of course. But really the main things that you're looking for in, in the whiskies as they age is um, very similar to like when you're bottle aging wine. Um, you know, for the white wines, you're kind of looking at acid structure and kind of thinking, oh, you know, does it have what it take to takes to get there and with the reds you're looking at tannin structure and whatnot so you're actually kind of thinking about both those things but particularly oak and and um how extracted the oak is in there that's probably the main thing if you're going to think about it from a like a, a technical point of view from like what you're looking for particularly is um you know has it already had a, a, enough extraction or is it gonna you know get too much because that that can absolutely happen if you're not not careful and particularly in Australia where we've got a, a warmer and drier climate compared to places like Scotland and Cognac that um, have a, a milder maturation that you can totally over over extract the tannin from a barrel absolutely. and then you can't blend that out that's cooked um, yeah. you can absolutely yeah. take too much um, particularly in the hotter climate so uh, yeah you're really kind of just edging them along and and waiting for that sweet spot yeah I think that's it's a really good point, Heather, in terms of that thing where, you, you know, you, you almost are looking for those casks that are a little bit gentler, a little bit less active. And as you say, like in the Australian climate, with that ABV climbing up and up and up year after year, once you're over that point of like sucking too much of like where really where the spirit starts to, you know, really kind of dissolve some of the stuff that's in the oak and all that. And it's like, once you get to that point, it's bad news bears. So if you're tasting something though, it's sort of 14, 15, 16 years and the cask is still really kind of in the background and being nice and gentle, then you might be able to think like, yeah, we can let this one go for a little while longer. Got a bit of a, a personal one here for Heather from Gully. Did you feel any pressure when you took over as head distiller? <laughs> I'd imagine so. <laughs> no, it was totally fine. No, I, um, you know, I didn't sleep for a while. 
I still lose sleep sometimes. It's a terrifying job in a, um, if you think about it, like, you know, what if in 10 years time I left hypothetically and they might be like then, oh yeah, Heather, she was the worst thing that could happen to that company, you know, but it'd take a decade to find out. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's an awesome, exciting challenge to, to get my paws around, but it's also quite scary because of the, the long-term project nature of whiskey, you know, you kind of got to have 20 years in your brain behind you and another 30 ahead. So it's scary. Yep. Absolutely. Very candid answer there. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks to the, everybody that's dropping out now. Appreciate. Oh, Sam has just made a great comment. Sullivan's is still the benchmark for Tassie whiskey, amazing people and bloody good, sorry, amazing whiskey and bloody good bunch of people. Just want to echo that right there. Such a benchmark. That's a lovely thing to say. Thank you. Um, unless anybody has any more questions, I reckon that this is pretty much the conclusion of our tasting, guys. How are you feeling? I, I had one more question. I'm, I'm really curious, like, uh, sorry, Heather, I know I've been peppering you with stuff all evening, but I'm really curious, like, had you tasted all of these whiskeys before? What do you reckon? Like, what's popping into your head, sort of having, having all of these uh, six different kind of American oak styles in front of you? Um, I think it actually, well, actually, I hadn't had uh, the first one. I've right. read a lot about it, but I haven't actually tasted it. So that was really interesting. Yeah, um, but it does represent the story of Sullivan's really, really accurately and quite authentically. When I think about, um, you know, as I have quite an intimate understanding of the way all of these were distilled just from going through records and, and you know, tasting similar whiskies and our Bond store and whatnot, like with, with guys like Richard and Ty, we've already mentioned, um, we, we form a large part of the tasting panel. So we tasted a huge portion of the, all of the Bond store and we understand the, the different eras. Um, and these reflect those eras really well. And they're, they're really well chosen whiskey spread. So good on you for that. Um, Thanks, mate. The lineup for tonight. But yeah, they represent the, the eras um, and the distillation styles and the maturation styles really well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and, and thanks heaps for thanks heaps for jumping on. It's a it's a it's a public holiday in Tasmania today, everybody. So I had this here on a public holiday. Oh, uh, it's not really. It's it's show day, <laughs> which actually it just means it's the day that all the nonners tell you you got to plant your tomatoes out. So we've been in the garden all day. Yeah, you got got in. the tomatoes in. Yeah. All good. yeah. <laughs> I mean, is, is the is the show happening this year? Because you know tomorrow's no. tomorrow's grand final day in Melbourne, but there's no grand final here. So yeah, there's no show here this year, but it's a public holiday, so you know you got to plant your tomatoes out. So you still need a day off. Good. Glad glad you got him in there. How's how's Charlie going with the gardening at the distillery? Oh, he's good. Green thumb Charlie's doing well. I'm expecting to see just like a beautiful jungle of passion fruit vines by the time I can make it down there. There's a jungle of passion fruit vines, all right. Yeah. Good. Um, and, and, and guys, like obviously just on, a, just on a personal note for anyone who's still listening in, un, under normal circumstances, I would be, like I live, I live in Melbourne, but I would be down at the distillery usually for about a week out of every month. So I spend about a quarter of my entire life living in Hobart and hanging out at the distillery every day. And I haven't been down there since January of this year. And I got to say, it's like, it's really strange to be sort of um, kept, kept away from the, from the sort of literal and spiritual home of Sullivan's Cove and all these guys who, um, who I usually get a chance to hang out with. So at least we get to do it online, hey, Heather? Agreed. Yeah, thanks for, for joining everybody. And uh, it's been really lovely. Fred, visiting in a couple of weeks, mate, and you're not going to be down there. Me? No. Yeah, I'm uh, heading down to have a drink with John Jarvis on oh, the... Oh, Mr. Hobart Whiskey, legend. 6th to the 9th, and he, uh, I, I hear you won't be down there. You're based in Melbourne, mate, so... Yeah, no, I won't be, unfortunately. Well, ho hopefully they'll let me back soon. No. Uh, but I say, Corey, I'm just going to echo everyone's statements about your back bar there, mate. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the liver would struggle to cope if I got stuck into it all. But um, <laughs> no. Is there 21 there behind you? That's absolutely epic. I, I don't think there's many that I've missed since I started going stupid in about 2018. But um, 
definitely pain through the nose for some of the older stuff though. Yeah, you find something that works though, mate, work it. <laughs> No. Corey, I just want to say, if you've gone through the last couple of months without drinking all of that, that back bar is pretty safe. I can't keep up. I think about 40 or so arrive every week. COVID's um, not done well for the bank account. Health does look good, though. <laughs> no, we're, uh, we, we, we're coping. But um, no, definitely enjoyed me Sullivan's Cove. I'm running out of room behind me. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like you're going to have to put some more shelves in. There's a, uh, a cellar going in the backyard when the pool gets dug. So uh, yeah. very, very lucky to have a wife that doesn't cane me over it and supports it. So it's She's all good. making you bury it in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> you know what would be cool and really interesting uh, temperature-wise? If you could get like a, a shelf or like a, a kind of a, a gap in the pool and then a bit of a glass front on it so you could go swimming and then have a look at all your whiskey underwater. <laughs> Right here, and then when you're in the whiskey room, you see people swimming around. Don't, don't, don't tempt him. My don't. business partner's sitting beside me saying, "Don't tempt him." So, <laughs> and the wife will echo that. She's outside. If she heard that, she'd be in here telling us to stop. So, um, there you go, Corey. Um, Ali has just said, "Let us know if you'd like to come and visit when you're down. We'd love to have you in." Oh, Ali, John sent me your uh, your mobile and details. I'll give you a call. Good stuff. Oh, awesome. Um, I know that, uh, so Sam's been with us for what, just over a year now, Sammy. And so, um, I imagine you wouldn't have had a chance to try some of these whiskeys before as well either. What do you reckon? No, I, um, I think I echoed the, the tasting notes of a lot of people with the millennium gold, that it was much better than I expected it to be. Uh, at Sullivan's Cove, we always sort of talk about a pre pat era and I had something in my brain that didn't quite match up to the reality. And uh, for me, it was, yeah, you know, disappointingly good. <laughs> what I'm really excited about, though, is the next one, not to be the sales guy, but I always am. Because for me, the biggest changes uh, that I've tasted in my time has been in the double cask. Mm. Uh, the American Oaks always had those same, um, sort of those same notes singing through. It's gotten more refined over time. But the double cask, when you taste some of the stuff, back when we were still doing it 40% ABV, and then compare it up to the stuff that Heather's putting out now. It's just night and day. So, yeah, you know, I just can't wait for the next one. Yeah, I think, I think it's a really good point, Sam, because obviously with Double Cast being our vatted expression, you see the changes happen more quickly, right? Because obviously we can sort of manipulate the flavour profile of that whiskey more quickly, depending on what casks Heather decides to put into that mix. Whereas with the single cask stuff, the changes are much, much more long-term and sort of incremental because you're just, yeah, you're just kind of tasting what people were doing 10 years ago. Um, so, yeah, definitely looking forward to that as well. But, yeah, we've got a couple of fun different batches of double cast to put, to put on the table. Speaking of the double cast, the DC... And once again, guys at Whiskey Now, thanks so much. It's been, uh, it's been fantastic. Oh, thanks for jumping in and thanks for opening up the museum to us. And that was a fantastic little Easter egg for the edition two of this Sullivan's Code Museum series we'll be doing with Fred. Ooh, we'll Brenda, I'd love to say any time, but I really can't. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure if it allowed. I'm sure if the stock allowed. <laughs> what, what were you going to ask, Corey? The DC95, what was special about that one? So with, with DC95, um, it was one of the first ones that we did at a higher ABV. So we actually put that one together specifically for Dark Mofo. Was it 2017 or 2018, Heather? It was, it was a couple of years ago. It must have been 18 because we haven't done that many batches since then, have we? DC95 would have been 2018. 2018, yeah. So we, that was the one that we were getting ready to do right around when Dark Mofo was happening in Hobart. And that's obviously like a big party for us. We always, um, you know, try to put out some interesting whiskeys for that. And we always do our Winter Feast edition, which I know you've got a couple of bottles of on the shelf, but that's very, very limited, always less than 100 bottles. So we wanted to do something that we sort of make a little bit more of to spread around. So with that addition of, of double cast, we um, made it a significantly higher ABV than usual. And we also um, didn't filter any of the casks at all. So it was like a bit more textural and a bit more funky and definitely a higher ABV. And again, it was one of those sort of experimental batches that sort of actually led us to make some changes permanently to, to the rest of the double cask. So uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a sort of watershed batch, I think. 
So worth trying a little bit. I found myself with four of them recently, so um, we may as well crack one and get stuck into it, I think. Oh, yeah, crack it. I mean, it's a delicious batch. I remember, like, yeah, Heather, I think that we just, you know, when I tasted that one, I was, I was basically one of those things that we were like, yeah, we should be doing this more often. What about the TV? That'll be tomorrow. Great. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, thank you so much. Much appreciated. No I love what you do. It's good to see you, mate. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I reckon that's about it, guys. If anybody else wants to jump in with any questions, go for it. Uh, so I take, shut up and take my money. <laughs> you got it. It's incoming soon. Don't worry. Just stay alert to those email inboxes. And once again, just a massive, massive thank you from the whole Whiskey and Almond team to the whole Solomon's Cove team and to all of you for joining us tonight. This has been such a great tasting. This has been such a pleasure to be able to be a part of. I can't wait to do it all again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Good night, guys. Cheers. Cheers, guys. We're pumped for the next one. Can't wait. Oh, you're all coming again. You said it now. Uh, <laughs> see I'll you guys. Great to see you all. See you all in person yeah. soon. Thanks, Ella. Thanks, Alex. See you, Alex. Bye, Sam. Cheers, Sam. Jules still hanging around anywhere? Do you want to say any words? Uh, I, I can't wait for the uh, second edition now, to be honest with you. It's, um, I, uh, I just spent um, uh, uh, two days last week doing judging with, um, with Patrick Maguire of the Australian Distilled Spirits Awards. And um, that's a tough nut to crack. So um, we'll be able to talk more about it next week um, or when, when the next tasting's on. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that and, um, and uh, telling everyone about um, how Patrick judges and how, uh, how tough a critic he is. So uh, <laughs> it'll, be, uh, it'll, be, it'll be some good chat. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, it, it's funny because, yeah, Pat can definitely be a pretty, a pretty harsh critic as I think that we all can when we're sitting on the tasting panel. At the same time, when he decides he likes something, he's just like, yeah, nah, put it in a bottle. Pretty tasty. That, that's right. Yeah, it was so, um, so night and day with him. Um, you know, it was just like dry, dry, you know, too much timber, you know, just really like blunt. And, <laughs> and here's, here's all the whiskey and element and the alumni putting everything in uh, lovely sentences. There was lots of oak and um, some nice wine characters, but then the oak was a little bit overwhelming at the end and, and dry. Uh, and, uh, and so it was, uh, it was really great to, uh, to have someone there who, who had obviously dealt with a lot of casks over a lot of time and, and be able to just sort of treat them as they were. And um, so I, I look forward to, um, to uh, the, our next, our next uh, tasting because there's a lot more of that French oak influence, which really sort of sets the cat amongst the pigeons um, when it comes to, is it ready or is it not? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I always think that, yeah, Patrick has been through sort of enough over the years at Sullivan's Cove that he, um, you know, he can be pretty objective about it because he's, he's seen enough ups and downs to just be able to be like, yep, nah, and not really worry about it too much if he doesn't think something's good or if he doesn't, doesn't think it's ready. But it's funny, I feel like having, having sat on the tasting panel with Pat for, for you know, a few, a few years, I always know um, that he was going to probably give something a tick of approval when he put his nose in it and then go, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that noise? He went, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, I know that when uh, the, uh, David Stewart does his tasting panel for the Belvenis in his in incredibly epic tasting room, they'll line all of the samples up and then they'll approach each glass and he'll pretty much have a gut instinct reaction of like, you know, if it's special or not from the moment he knows it. He won't sit there with his nose in it for like 20 minutes and, and really, really analyze it first go around. He'll take the, the exact first reaction and then he'll put that into a lineup, which he'll then go and take a really closer look and then decide from that which he bottles. So it really is like, it's so interesting hearing how different people at different legends select their spirits and like treat these spirits because it is all so subjective, isn't it? Like yeah. you know, they're changing, you know, the, the ABV by 0.1 at each time. And then, you know, you've got David Stewart, but he'll just dismiss a glass if he doesn't like it straight away. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, uh... Uh, you know, we, we definitely like said that a couple of times doing tastings, both, you know, like judging spirits competitions and down at Sullivan's Cove sort of selecting casks and stuff. And it's like, if you're trying to fight with yourself for a reason to enjoy something, no good. Yeah. No, it's like if you're having to, if you're having to sort of intellectualize it for it to be enjoyable, then it's kind of like, well, 
you know, we're trying to make stuff that everybody's going to enjoy, or at least the people who enjoy our styles of whiskey are going to just immediately pour themselves a glass and go, yeah, that's delicious without having to think too hard about it. And interestingly enough, next time around as well, we might have one or two whiskeys in the lineup that maybe are that for us, where they're like, we, we like them and we think they're interesting, but we think that they might be a little bit too divisive to, to necessary, um, necessarily just kind of put out there into the market. Uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, because it obviously happens. Not, not every one of our casks is something that we can give an enthusiastic thumbs up to. Yeah. And on that, I, I think that there's enough suspense built for the next tasting, don't you? Yeah, I think there probably is. <laughs> Shall we raise a final glass, guys? I've got a bunch of my American Oak refill left, so I'm cheersing with that. Thanks again to everybody that joined us tonight. Thank you so much to Sullivan's Cove for opening up their museum to us and facilitating this incredible tasting. And I'm so excited to see you for addition to So Sanjava. Cheers. Cheers and thank you. Thanks for having us. See you. Bye, guys. See ya.